Hey guys, I am so happy to be here. Uh, this I consider my adopted home, Reno, and uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that some of my greatest innovations actually happened uh, in the physics department of the University of Nevada, Reno. So when, yeah. Yeah, so when, so when Brett invited me, I jumped on the chance and we started talking, you know, what, what things I could talk about. I've been on the, you know, TED main stage and given a bunch of talks and about different things I've done and, and well, what's the biggest? Uh, what's the biggest thing I could talk about? Energy. Uh, and energy is, is the biggest thing, the biggest problem that we face as a society. And just as we had this conversation about what the talk would be about, we had the same conversation about, uh, or I had the same conversation with myself about what I could do with my life. You know, I'd worked on some really hard problems and I needed to challenge, so I thought I would take on the energy challenge. Uh, energy is a challenge, and it's a challenge of sustainability. Uh, we need, as a civilization, as a planet, sustainable energy, and that does not exist today. Um, you know, we get caught up a lot in the politics of climate change, but the fact of the matter is, you know, every year we're emitting something like over 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which has a lot of effects. We can see in the laboratory that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and traps heat. We can see in the laboratory that when you put carbon dioxide into seawater, it acidifies it. It, it, it creates what's called carbonic acid, and that carbonic acid can dissolve the shells of calcium carbonate-based organisms, which is much of the life in the ocean, most, most of the ocean's ecosystem. So take one of these problems, not to mention the fact that, you know, over a million of people are dying a year in China from air pollution problems that are mainly caused from the production of energy. These particulates go into the lungs and into the bloodstream and can cause health effects. So it's one of these things where, like, you know, take one of these Pro take one of these problems created by the use of fossil fuels, not to mention the fact that the world's economy is driven by a finite resource that, I don't know if you guys have been following the stock market this start of the year, but it's been on a roller coaster, and it's been on a roller coaster because uh, this resource that drives civilization, oil, petrochem petrochemicals, hydrocarbons that we extract from the ground has also been on a roller coaster and has, the bottoms dropped out of it and that has impacted the world economy. That shows you how important energy is. Um, it's a huge problem, it really is. There's a billion people in the world that don't have access to energy and that's a billion people who include people like me, people who have the talent, who have the interest to go out there and make the world a better place. And we have the technology in the digital age that we're in to wire the entire world, to, world together with communication technology. But if you don't have electricity, if you don't have energy, you can't do anything. And so those things combined, the price of electricity, the amount of electricity that needs to be generated, uh, I say electricity, uh, but that's, that's energy in, in, in general, whether it's transportation fuels or actually electrical production. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, so that's, that's you know, a billion people we need to create a, a, a new energy network for, and we need to do it in a more low-cost manner. Energy drives economies, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's uh, healthcare, whether it's the production of food and agriculture, uh, you can take salt water and make it into fresh water using desalination. It's only a question of energy, and today energy is too expensive to do these things and do these things on a global scale. So that is the energy sustainability problem. And it starts to look like a pessimistic picture if you look at you know the ice caps melting and the ocean acidifying and wars over energy resources and all these things. But I was really lucky that when I was 10 years old, I found this field, I found nuclear science, which really, at the end of the day, what it is, is it's investigating the heart of matter. Like, it's the most fundamental investigation of the building blocks of our everyday lives. Atoms, how they're structured, how you can combine them or separate them, and typically that involves the release of a lot of energy. And I found this when I was really young and I worked on medical and security issues and did all these things. And, and one day I decided I'm going to take nuclear science 
and I'm gonna solve the energy crisis. I'm gonna do it. Like, you know, it's a big problem, but it's, I can't work on anything else until I fix this problem. So, so that's what I decided. So, so how do you do that? Like, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a planetary scale problem. Well, you do it in a lot of different ways. There's not one silver bullet, but I've tried to find a couple of uh, maybe precious, semi-precious metal bullets. So uh, I'll go through a few of those. So as I said, I was the youngest person to produce nuclear fusion at 14. I did that, and in, in, in actually that reactor lived up at the University of Nevada for many years. And again, you may say, well, if you built a fusion reactor, why can't you just give us all a fusion reactor and we'll go home and we'll We'll start doing other things. Well, that fusion reactor doesn't break even or produce more power out than I put in. Um, but that's where we're going with fusion. Fusion is the ultimate energy source. The fuels are abundant, they're in seawater, they're hydrogen, they're the lightest, most abundant elements uh, in the universe. And when you combine them, there's a little bit of a missing mass in the final product when you combine those atoms. And that missing mass has been converted into some form of usable energy, heat. It's just we've never built a fusion reactor that produces more power out than we put in. And I've kind of had fun and dabbled in a few different fusion efforts and, and kind of come to this conclusion that we're standing on the precipice of change in fusion, that I personally cannot tell you which fusion effort will produce a break-even device, but it's coming. I also can't tell you how fast it's coming, but what I can tell you is once we reach that break-even point, it's probably about a decade of R&D and material science and engineering to get to something that is a workable power plant, something that's an economical power plant and can bring you know, very competitive or lower cost electricity to the grid. Um, so I kind of you know, took a step back. I was like, you know, fusion's great, uh, love this stuff, but uh, what does physics allow us to do today? And it actually allows us to do some pretty cool stuff. I looked at fission, which was the nuclear energy source of the 20th century, what atomic bombs are based off of. And, you know, that provides, you know, a, a, a fifth of the United States' uh, energy. And the vast majority of the carbon-free energy we produce comes from nuclear power sources because it's very dense and it doesn't emit carbon in the atmosphere. And they can be made safe, but at the expense of expense. They're very expensive power plants to build. And uh, there's a waste issue, of course. And so I looked at all this stuff and I was like, well, how do we build a better nuclear power plant? And the majority of my effort these days goes into that question. How do we make a nuclear power plant that's economically competitive with natural gas, something you can build in a factory as opposed to building out at a site where everyone is kind of an individual thing built from a, a million parts and something that's standardized, built in the factory, can't melt down. There's no inclination to release radioactivity in the event of an accident. You've reduced significantly, not only the quantity of the nuclear waste, but the amount of time you have to store it for until the point where it no longer becomes hazardous to human health. And I'm working on that, and that's, that's really fun and rewarding, these little small reactors. And, and they're coming. I'm not gonna tell you when they're gonna hit market, because I've made that mistake before. No, technology's hard. <laughs> But I think it's okay. I think we'll, I think we'll get there. Part, a spinoff of that or a related part to that is nuclear power sources are kind of like other power sources or, or energy sources and that typically they produce heat. You know, whether you're, you're you know, burning coal or natural gas or you're with mirrors collecting energy from the sun and pointing that at a tower, typically what you're doing is you're generating heat in some way and in the vast majority of situations, you're boiling water, water turns to steam, steam turns a turbine, turbine spins in a generator and produces electricity. And that means if you look at like the typical nuclear power plant, it's about a third efficient. That's the, thermo, that's the thermodynamic efficiency of how much you know, energy the plant produces from a combustion process or a nuclear process and, and, or a solar process and, and how much is actually converted to electricity. Um, so as part of this reactor development process, I took a look at some technologies and the one I kind of decided I really wanted to go with is what's called a, a supercritical CO2 Brayton cycle. 
uh, which is just a lot of fancy words for kind of a closed cycle gas turbine that, like a jet engine. It's kind of very similar to how a jet engine works. You seal the system, you heat up some, some CO2 with your reactor, your solar fired concentrated solar plant, you expand that through a turbine, you recompress it, and by doing all this work with the thermodynamics and the engineering and the materials, um, my goal is to produce a system that is, goes from being a third, a third efficient in converting heat to electricity to something closer to a half. So where half of the energy that's being created is actually being converted to electricity. And if you do that, and you do that with the existing infrastructure and you create new solar thermal plants and, and nuclear plants using this, I mean, that's like, you know, that's, that's more than 10% of uh, power that didn't exist if you just use an old, like, water, you know, uh, Rankin cycle. So that's a really exciting thing for me. Uh, <laughs> impacts a few different things. And then I was looking at renewables, because renewables are great. Renewables truly are a you know, 21st century technology. I mean, if you think about wind turbines and, and solar panels, this is something that, that is, is, is basically viewed, and, and rightfully so, as, as this 21st uh, century energy source. Uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, there's a reason that we don't have tens of percent of our power from renewable energy sources. Um, there's efficiency issues, but at the end of the day, there's the intermittency issue. Um, there's lots of studies that are done that say, you know, when the sun isn't shining, the wind blows, or all these things. But at the end of the day, when a utility goes to install renewables, they have to hedge their bets. They have to back it with a more constant output base load type power source, uh, typically natural gas, because the natural gas is inexpensive. And because we're using natural gas, our carbon emissions, at least in this country, have plateaued. Um, but anyway, we, we, renewables are, are, are by no means a dead technology for that reason. What exists today, though, is a storage problem. And you either have to back it up with something like natural gas or nuclear, either fission, advanced fission or fusion technologies, or storage technology. If we can get under $100 a kilowatt hour for storage, we're golden. We can do that. And we can make low-cost electricity work from renewables with more than 10 or 20% penetration. You know, right now, we're limited to maybe 20% penetration from renewables, and that's with a very large grid. That's with a, a you know, domestic size power grid where you can you know, offset the loads and do things like that. So, so anyway, that's, that's, that's great. I one day was thinking about that, and I was thinking about this material called graphene. Anybody familiar with graphene? Maybe a little bit? Okay, so, so another 21st century material. It is a single layer of carbon atoms that are bonded together. So it's, it blows my mind. You can actually take, I mean, you can take this material and it's an atom thick, and it's carbon atoms that are bonded together, and electrons kind of surf across the surface of this material, which when it comes to things like electron transport, you know, conductivity, you know, conducting electricity, nothing better. And it was discovered in 2004 by peeling the carbon layers, uh, the, the graphene layers, off like pencil lead with scotch tape. So that doesn't really scale. People know graphene's great. Graphene's going to just just put in graphene as opposed to normal conductors. You've increased the efficiency of solar panels, of batteries for energy storage, lowering the cost of, of those battery technologies, things like that. And, uh, but we have to produce it in mass quantity. So I was kind of tinkering around with this. I was like, oh, I think I can do this. So I figured out actually a way to do it with radiation. So radiation technique, where you're actually using the radiation to bombard, bombard water, the water disassociates, becomes a very, very strong reducing agent, and you can reduce what's called graphene oxide, or basically oxidized pencil lead. And you're left with this pretty idealized graphene, but it's something that can scale up to an industrial scale. So that was kind of fun, had fun with that. Hopefully that'll be a way that we can make solar panels and batteries and all this stuff. And uh, it's actually research that I've collaborated with the University of Nevada on, so uh, uh, there's, some, there's a lot of talent up there and a, a, a bright future for that university in this region. Uh, so anyway, that's the energy story. Uh, we're not there yet, but I kind of hope that what this, talk's gives you, what this talk gives you is uh, a lot of optimism. Uh, 
I've always been a very curious person. That's why I got into science. Like, so curious. Like, everything in the world, I want to know how it works, and also why we do it that way, because that's not always obvious. And not, so, so I made a career out of learning, A, how things work, things maybe we didn't even know before, and uh, why they work, and why they work that way, and can we make them work a better way. And I've pretty much found that if you use physics as, as your base principle reasoning for the way the world works, the laws you can't break, politics or, or public opinion, money, they're all, they're all doable, they're all changeable, and technology can drive just incredible change in the world. Certainly it has its downsides. I see some people on their phones. Shame on you, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we, kn we know technology has its downsides, but technology will get us out of the problems that technology created, um, whether it's the changing global climate, running out of water, uh, needing to, to feed, uh, you know, something like seven billion people, it's crazy, but anyway. Uh, so thank you guys so much, uh, appreciate it.